Hello everyone. The name of this fan fiction story is I'm Voldemort. Chapter 1, Beginning All alone inside a single bedroom of Wool's orphanage, lay a sleeping boy around eleven years old with pitch black hair. If his eyes lids were to open, his bright red eyes could almost brighten up the room. The boy looks so peaceful as he sleeps, but every other child in the orphanage knows that he's anything but peaceful. This boy is a menace that would use anybody to get what he wants, and God forbid someone gets on his bad side. He once killed a fellow orphan's cat because she would call him names and the cat hissed at him. That wasn't the only time he did something horrible to someone in the orphanage, and it certainly wasn't the worst. The problem is there's never any proof that he did anything but everyone knew it was him. If asked why they thought it was him, almost everyone would reply there's just something off about him. There's a reason this boy is sleeping alone in his own room, and that is because the matron doesn't trust him alone with the other children. Not after he made a child break their arm with words alone. That's right he made the poor child snap his arm and didn't even have to deploy any of his powers to do so. Yes, that's right. This boy has powers. When his emotions are high and or he feels threatened, his power would rise to the surface and cause chaos. He has tried his hardest to study his powers and take a hold of them, but that's easier said than done. He has been trying to move things with his powers recently as a way to start training them. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but with every added day of training, it feels like it becomes easier for him. He can also talk to animals, or at least the snakes in the garden. A few years ago, he was sitting alone in the garden when he heard someone talking yet no one was anywhere near him. It wound up being a snake hidden in a bush close by. When he tried speaking to the snake, it called him a speaker and started acting very respectfully. At first, he thought the snake was speaking English, but it was actually hissing, and he had been hissing as well. As the sun rises through the windows, the boy opens his red eyes and squints. He hates mornings and everything that comes with them. The breakfast the orphanage served is plain, and the fact that everyone wants to say good morning infuriated the boy. Every time someone says good morning the boy would think no, it's not a good morning so leave me alone. He wouldn't say it out loud as long as no one pestered him too much. The matron would jump at the chance to punish him for stepping out of line. I break a few kids' bones and now I can't even breath out of tone or the matron would start hounding me. Maybe I should just kill her? Nah, I don't want to be homeless if they close the orphanage because of her death. He sighed and got out of bed. When the boy was about to start cleaning himself up and change clothes, a tap could be heard from the window. Sat outside the window is a brown owl holding a letter. The owl is tapping its beak on the glass as if asking for the boy to open the window. The boy stared at the owl in confusion for a moment. Is the letter for me? He thought. No one has ever sent him letters. Especially not one delivered by an owl. He hesitantly opens the window and takes the letter from the owl. Once the letter left the owl's care, it flies off into the sky and disappears past the clouds. The letter is addressed to Mr. Thomas M. Riddle, so it has to be a letter for him. What is odd about the letter is that it's addressed to the single bedroom of Wool's Orphanage, London. Why was it addressed so specifically? With curiosity getting the better of him, Tom opens the letter and started reading. Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry Headmaster, Armando Dippet Dear Mr. Riddle We are pleased to inform you that you have been accepted at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Please find enclosed a list of all necessary books and equipment. The term begins on September 1st. A member of the Hogwarts staff will arrive in one week to answer any of your questions. They will also be escorting you to get supplies for the school year to come. Yours sincerely, Albus Dumbledore, Deputy Headmaster. Second page Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Uniform First year students will require 1. Three sets of plain work robes, black. 2. One plain pointed hat, black, for day wear. 
3. One pair of protective gloves. Dragon hide or similar. 4. One winter cloak, black, with silver fastenings. Please note that all pupils' clothes should carry name tags. Course books. All students should have a copy of each of the following. Long list of books here. Other equipment. One wand. One cauldron, pewter, standard size 2. One set glass or crystal vials. One telescope. One set brass scales. Students may also bring, if they desire, an owl or a cat or a toad. Parents are reminded that first years are not allowed their own broomstick. Yours sincerely. Lucinda Thompsonical Pocus. Chief Attendant of Witchcraft Provisions. The second Tom finished reading the letter, a pain racked his mind that sent him barreling towards the floor. The pain was so great that the screams that exited Tom's mouth woke everyone in the orphanage. After a few moments of rolling around and screaming on the wood floor, the door to the room bursts open, and the matron enters with a worried expression. She thought for sure that Tom was torturing a fellow orphan or some animal. As she entered the room filled with screams, the matron saw Tom rolling around the floor screaming with his hands clutching his head. Although she is wary of the boy, she couldn't stop herself from dashing to the boy's side to check on him. She is a matron of an orphanage, after all. She could never leave a child in pain, not even Tom Riddle. After trying her best to comfort the boy and looking for what's wrong, the matron could see no injuries or any signs of where the pain could be coming from. The screams haven't ended since she entered. In fact, the screams are getting louder as time goes on. Not knowing what to do, the matron placed Tom in his bed and left the room to contact a doctor. Meanwhile, something incredible is happening within young Tom Riddle. Tom's dark evil soul is somehow fusing with a bright white pure soul. The fusion is like dumping a cup of water into a pot of burning hot oil. The reaction is very fiery hence the pain Tom is going through. Although the reaction is very painful, the fusion happens slowly and the two souls become one. The new soul that resides in Tom Riddle's body is now a grey soul. Not good or evil but simply neutral. This type of soul is rare and seldom appears. A few minutes after the matron leaves Tom screaming in the room alone, the screams die down and Tom falls into a peaceful sleep once again. Chapter 2 Merge When Tom awoke from his sleep, his head was aching, but he could barely understand the change that happened to him. After getting used to the dull pain in his head, Tom sat up in bed and just stared at the wall. As he stared at the wall, memories from the two merged souls play in his mind. He feels as if he has lived as both Tom Riddle and this other soul. The memories of both lives play in his mind as he relives everything either person has ever experienced. While in this state, the matron enters the room and sees that Tom is awake. She immediately turns around and leaves the room to inform the doctor. Tom didn't notice her at all, as he is too preoccupied with the memories that are integrating into his mind. He didn't know that their souls merged, but he does have the memories of another life inside his head. The memories that are now in his mind are of a boy named Gregory. Gregory lived in a world similar to his and died whilst crossing the street. Both of their memories had nothing to explain how they ended up merging though. That's right, merging. Tom isn't just Tom anymore. He may go by that name from now on, but he is a mixture of both Gregory and Tom. I guess that would make him a new person. The feeling of being two people and living such separate lives is definitely an odd one. How could Greg's consciousness make its way here to this universe? Instead of dimension hopping, it could be some sort of time travel. Maybe it's one of my past lives that I'm remembering somehow? Does this have something to do with that odd letter? He thinks and something clicks in his mind as he remembers the letter. That letter was addressed to Tom M. Riddle. Hogwarts. The letter said that the school is called Hogwarts. Oh my god, I'm in the Harry Potter universe. This is just like those fan fictions I've read as Gregory. Gregory must have transmigrated into Tom and now here we are. 
Isn't the person being transmigrated supposed to take over the body though? I don't think I've ever read a fan fiction where they merge. Whatever, it's not like I can do anything about it. At least I'm not Harry. That boy had to deal with way too much shit from a young age. Tom Riddle may not have had it good, but I can work with this. From now on I'm Tom Riddle. I don't quite agree with the things the old Tom has done, but I'll just have to move past it. I may not agree with what he did, but I couldn't care less about the fact that he did it, and I certainly won't be apologizing for it. Tom was good at covering his tracks anyway, so I probably have nothing to worry about. Suddenly, the door to Tom's room slams open, and in walks a worried-looking matron followed by an elderly man with a stethoscope hanging on his neck. The man moves to Tom's side and starts asking him question after question. How are you feeling? Do you know who you are? Where you are? Why did your head hurt so much? Did you eat anything funny? Throughout these non-stop questions, the matron stood over me with a worried expression. Once Tom answered every question given by the doctor, he says that Tom probably just had a really bad migraine and to let him know if it happens again. When the doctor finally left, the matron brought me food and told me to rest. Dinner was pretty disgusting compared to the foods Gregory used to eat. The old Tom was used to the orphanage's horrible food, but now it makes him want to throw up. He knew that if he wasted this food, he wouldn't get any more as the orphanage isn't exactly rolling in money. With the thought that eating bad food is better than starving constantly repeating in his mind, Tom tries to eat as quickly as possible to get it over with. Once his plate was empty, it was time to come up with a game plan. Dumbledore will be arriving in a week and he needs to come up with a plan. 1. He needs to get a book on a clemency to protect his future knowledge. A lot of fan fictions that he's read say that the twinkle in Dumbledore's eye is him using legitimacy to read someone's mind. Tom already knows that Dumbledore is going to be suspicious of him. The matron and the kids will probably say something about him, so there's a big chance that he will read my mind or at least try to. The question is how will Tom learn a clemency in just one week? He could try to learn a clemency from scratch without any help, but that would take far longer than it would if he had a book that explained it. This brings Tom to the conclusion that he needs to go to Diagon Alley. He needs to buy a book on a clemency in order to study and get his mind protected. There is only one problem, Tom has no idea where to find the place. Even if he knew where it was, he had no way of getting there other than walking, and that could only happen if he's able to sneak out somehow. Suddenly, an idea sparks to life in Tom's head. It may not work but it's worth a try. If it does work then he will have a book on a clemency by the end of the day. It's worth a try. He thinks as he opens his mouth to speak. If there are any house elves that haven't bonded with a family, I'm interested in becoming your master. Tom stated out loud and wait for a couple of moments for any type of response. Mimsy is looking for a master to serve. Chapter 3, Mimsy the House Elf Pop. Mimsy is looking for a master to serve. With the sound of a pop, a young-looking house elf dressed in a pillowcase appears. Based on the bows made of rags tied around both of its ears, it's a safe bet that this elf is a girl. It's hard to tell with elves sometimes, as they all kind of look the same. Their names don't help much either. Hello, Mimsy, I'm Tom Riddle. Why don't you tell me about yourself? Tom says as he looks at the real house elf before him. Mimsy is a young elf. She is the daughter of elves from a house of bad masters. They don't treat Mimsy's parents good at all, so Mimsy ran away and has been hungry ever since. She says and Tom nods in agreement, as she does look like she hasn't eaten in a while. Why haven't you been eating? Can't you just steal food with magic? Tom asks in confusion. House elves don't be eaten human foods. She shakes her head. We eats the leftover magic from our masters. Mimsy never had a master so I've never ate nothing in forever. Mimsy says as she holds her stomach and looks at Tom with expectant eyes. What useful parasites these house elves are. 
They offer themselves as slaves for leftover magic that no one would ever use. Tom thinks. Well, I'm willing to take you in as my house elf, but before that, do you still have access to the bad master's house? Tom asks, hoping to rob them of some much needed books and supplies. No, if Mimsy try and go back, the pain comes and then I gotta leave, or else it gets worse. She says as she grimaced at the memory of when she wanted to visit her parents. Hmm, they must have taken you off the wards. Tom says as he shakes his head in disappointment. All right, I guess we can bond now. How do we do it? He asks. Yuz just has to put your hand on Mimsy's head and say you wish to be her master. Mimsy explains. Tom does as she says and with his hand on her head he speaks the words. I wish to be Mimsy's master. Tom says and they both glow slightly. Interesting, I feel as though we have some sort of a connection now. He says in a bit of wonder. Mimsy's condition looked to improve constantly. The look on her face is that of pure bliss. I guess my magic tastes good and it must be healthy for her as she's healing rather quickly from her former malnourished state. Are you feeling better now? Tom asks and receives a happy nod. Yes, Master. Master's magic is very tasty. Mimsy says as she smiles contently. Good to hear. Are you feeling well enough to take me somewhere? Tom asks as she perks up. Mimsy will gladly do anything for Master. She says excitedly. Good, I need you to pop me over to Gringotts Bank. I have some business there to take care of. Once we're finished there, I'll most likely have some errands for you to run for me. Tom says and Mimsy nodded along happily. Mimsy can do that. Does Master want to leave now? She asks excitedly. Hmm, do you know what time Gringotts closes? Tom asks and Mimsy shakes her head. No, but Mimsy will find out. She says and disappears with a pop. Before Tom could fully process what happened, Mimsy returned with a smile on her face. The mean goblins say the bank be closin' at 9 p.m. She said, happy that she is helping her new master. Hmm, that's good, but next time ask for permission before popping off like that. I can't have my cards shown because you act a bit too overzealous. Tom says with a hint of disapproval in his voice. Sa say sorry master. Mimsy just wants to help. Mimsy says as her ears go down like a dejected dog. I'm glad to accept your help, Mimsy. Just ask before you act next time, all right? Tom says in a comforting manner. Yes, master. Mimsy won't let you down, she promises. She wipes her tears and stands a bit taller, ready to take on whatever task her master can throw at her. That's good to hear, Mimsy. We need to set some ground rules though. Tom says and Mimsy nods. First, I'm currently living in a muggle orphanage, so unless I'm alone, hide unless I call you out. Even if the person with me is a witch or wizard, you must stay hidden no matter what. Do you understand? She nods her head in comprehension. Second, everything that is talked about between us stays between us. If another elf or anyone comes to speak with you about me or anything, you make an excuse to leave and come tell me about it immediately. Master's secrets be safe with Mimsy no matter what. She states resolutely. Good, I've heard that some elves aren't treated well. I will treat you perfectly fair as long as you're loyal and work hard. Any mistakes that happen are easily forgiven. So just come to me if you have any problems, all right? Tom says and Mimsy starts crying on the spot. Seeing his new elf start wailing, Tom gets up and covers her mouth. He wanted to win the elf's loyalty, not cause the whole orphanage to investigate why someone's crying in his room. I know you're happy about all of this, but if you cry any louder the muggles will come to see what's happening. Tom says and Mimsy's eyes widen as she stops crying. Sa sorry, master. She says as her ears lower just like before. No problem. Just be careful from now on. She nods, happy that she found such a kind and understanding master. All right, 
Every child has to be in bed by 7 p.m., so we will go to Gringotts around 7.30 p.m. just to be safe. Tom says, not wanting the matron to find out he left. Should Mimsy start hiding now, or does Master needs anything? Mimsy asked, ready to serve at a moment's notice. Hmm, I have a job for you. If you're feeling up for it. Tom responds. Mimsy is up for it, Master. She says excitedly. Good, this job shouldn't be too hard for you. You just have to use your magic to acquire some currency for me. Tom says with an evil smile forming on his lips. Chapter 4, Mimsy's Day Out In a crowded street filled with people rushing home from a long day of work, multiple people are screaming and yelling for the police. Police. Someone stole my wallet. Help. My purse. Someone stole it. Did anyone see who stole my wallet? These screams kept increasing by the second until about 20% of the crowd was up in arms. Unseen and unheard by anyone on the street is the young house elf, Mimsy. A sack over her shoulder filled with the wallets and purses of every one of her victims. A happy smile on her face as she has completed her master's task. Her kind and beloved master has given her a task and she will go through hell to complete it. She was told to find the busiest street in London and rob a good chunk of the people on it. Her master told her not to go overboard and only steal from ever 20 out of 100 people. She was also told to aim for the more well-dressed and wealthy-looking among the crowd. There's no need to cause too much of a fuss. Her master didn't want the Aurors to be notified. With her elf magic, this task was like taking candy from a baby. With her sack filled high with the loot of her victims, Mimsy pops away leaving chaos in her wake. Shortly after she leaves, the police fill the streets. Never have so many people been pickpocketed at once. So many people contacted the police, that the street was blocked off. After taking every victim's statement, it was estimated that whichever group pulled this off made almost £25,000. The police were stumped as no one saw anything and no evidence was left behind. Back at the orphanage, Tom is sat on his bed waiting patiently for Mimsy's return. He sent her out to get him some money. He has a small stash saved up from old Tom, but it's better to have as much as possible. Especially before heading to Gringotts. If anything he's read as Gregory is true, goblins are a greedy bunch that only answer to coin. Tom just knows that the conversion from pound to galleon will be a total rip-off. This is why he is trying to stack up as much money as possible before he leaves. Tom wanted to steal from some drug dealers or something, but that would need some prior investigating. He has no idea where he can find drug dealers or gang members. Being an orphan doesn't allow for much time outside the orphanage. Then he thought of stealing from a bank. All Mimsy would have to do is become invisible, which she can do, and pop into the nearest bank for a withdrawal. That idea sounded far too easy. There is no way that the magical world doesn't have a defense against something like this. If they didn't, then Tom would be extremely surprised. Although, he can't take that kind of risk. With those two ideas gone from his checklist, Tom settled on going old school. He sent Mimsy out to pick the pockets of the richest people she could see, on the busiest street during the time everyone is rushing home from work. This was the next best plan that Tom could come up with. It fit his time constraints perfectly and should net him a healthy sum of money. He didn't need millions of pounds, just enough to get what he wants from the goblins. After waiting for thirty minutes, a pop could be heard and Mimsy had returned. When Tom saw her he almost busted out laughing on the spot. This house elf is carrying a sack three times her size over her shoulder like Santa Claus. The smile on her face was blinding as she sets the sack down. It tips over and a cascade of wallets and purses come falling out. Mimsy stares at Tom with a proud smile and awaits her master's praise. Tom didn't disappoint, as he got up and pats her bald elf head. Good job, Mimsy. No one saw you right? He asks just to be sure. No, Mimsy did everything as Master explained. 
she says with a proud smile as she leans into her head pats. Good, I wasn't wrong to take you as my elf. Tom says and sits back down. Those words sent tingles up Mimsy's spine as she squealed in delight. Her master appreciates her hard work. This is the total opposite of how the bad masters treat her parents. Now, I need you to take all of the cash out of the wallets and purses. After you've done that, I need you to deliver the wallets and purses to a dumpster. Preferably a dumpster near the area you stole them from. The police should be searching the area, so they can return these to their owners. Tom says and Mimsy gets to work. Once Mimsy left to drop the wallets and purses off, Tom got to counting the fat stack of cash she left behind. Mimsy returned before he could finish, but he didn't trust her to count the money. She hasn't been to school and will just end up messing it up. It's doubtful that she even knows the name of Muggle Currency. When he finally finished counting, he has 24,623 pounds and 5 pence. Adding in the money saved by old Tom and he now has 24,780 pounds and 20 pence. This little move made him a lot more money than he thought he would get. It's too bad that he won't be able to do this again any time soon. A one-time occurrence can easily be written off as skilled muggle thieves, but if it were to happen over and over, that is when the Aurus will start becoming suspicious. Tom doesn't need that suspicion. He'll get enough of it when Dumbledore arrives. Tom hides the money under a loose floorboard where old Tom used to hide his money. With his plan completed, Tom looks outside to see the sun has completely gone down. All right, it's getting late. Mimsy, I need you to hide until I call you out. The matron will be making her rounds to put everyone to bed soon. Tom says as he makes sure the floorboard is properly covered. Yes, sir. She says and pops away. Chapter 5. Dress to Impress. Once the matron arrived, she questioned Tom on how he's feeling, but still kept her distance. She may worry for him as a child, but that doesn't erase the past encounters with old Tom. The wariness built inside of her won't crumble that easily. It's been built on eleven years of raising this child, so her actions are justified. After asking her questions, Tom was told to get to bed. Tom went straight to bed and tucked himself in, hoping she would leave as quickly as possible. Seeing that Tom was all right and in bed, the matron left to attend to the other children. Tom didn't even leave his bed when the matron left the room, not trusting the squeaky floorboards to give him away. Instead, he called for Mimsy, and with a pop, she appeared at his bedside. Yes, master? She asked. Climb on the bed, Mimsy. I don't want the matron to hear you walking on the floor. Tom says and Mimsy looks apprehensive. Master, elves can't be going on the master's beds. She says as she is torn between what she was taught and following her master's orders. Mimsy, get on this bed right now before you ruin my plans. Tom says as he puts a bit more seriousness in his voice. With an uneasy look on her face, Mimsy climbs on the bed and sits facing her master. She looks truly anxious just sitting there not knowing what to do with herself. Good, now do you have a spell that can mute the sound of the floorboards? Hell, mute any sound from leaving the room if you can. Tom asks. Seeing her way out of this alarming situation, Mimsy doesn't even answer as she snaps her fingers and mutes any sound from leaving the room in any direction. With that taken care of, she swiftly leaves the bed as quickly as possible. Her feet hitting the floor causes a thud and the floorboards squeak, but that sound doesn't transfer outside of the room. I take it you muted the sound from leaving the room? Tom asks, hoping she didn't just jump off the bed and alert the matron. Mimsy nods her head and looks sad at her earlier behavior. Sa sorry, master. Elves is taught to not be on the master's bed, so Mimsy didn't know what to do. She apologized as her ears flop over as usual when she's sad. It's fine, Mimsy. Just remember to try your best to follow my orders next time, okay? Tom says and Mimsy nods happily. Once the sound problem was taken care of, 
Tom looked for a suitable outfit to wear to Gringotts. His wardrobe is that of an orphan, so he doesn't have the finest of clothes. In fact, most of his clothes are hand-me-downs or donations to the orphanage. Not finding anything that would look nice, he enlists Mimsy to go and steal him some clothes and shoes. He gave her his sizes and told her the colors he likes, which were mainly blacks, grays, whites, dark browns, and dark blues. For the next half an hour, Mimsy would come and go with piles of clothes. Mimsy would pop away and steal some clothes for him to go through, and anything he didn't like would be sent back. Once it was time to leave, Tom ended his at-home shopping spree and got dressed. He wore a long-sleeve black button-up shirt tucked into slim dark gray slacks, a pair of dark brown leather boots with black socks, and a dark brown leather jacket. If you want to get anywhere in life, you must dress to impress. People tend to like good-looking people and a way to look good is to dress smart. Tom could have gone to get some wizard robes, but he would rather not show his face too soon. What if when Dumbledore takes him to get clothes for school, the owner welcomes Tom as a repeat customer? That would just ruin everything. He wouldn't be able to send Mimsy either, as they have to take your measurements there if the first Harry Potter movie is anything to go by. Also, Tom sees wizarding fashion as outdated and not so appealing. Some may say that going to Gringotts is risky as well, but why would Tom have to go there? The only reason Harry had to go to Gringotts is that he had a trust vault to withdraw from for supplies. In the eyes of everyone else, Tom is a muggle-born and does not need to go to Gringotts. He also plans to bribe the goblins to stay quiet on the off chance Dumbledore does take him to Gringotts. Hence the pickpocket plan that he sent Mimsy on. Once Tom was dressed and ready to go, he had Mimsy hide the pile of clothes somewhere. Can't have the matron questioning where a pile of brand new clothes came from. He then retrieves his money from the removable floorboard and stashes it in his jacket pocket. Tom then puts on a blank white porcelain mask to hide his face. He asked Mimsy to pick one up during the shopping spree. All right, Mimsy. I'm ready to go. Tom says as he walks over to Mimsy. Master has to hold Mimsy's hand and not let go. Mimsy says and Tom follows her directions. All right, I'm ready. Tom says and they pop away leaving an empty dark room behind. Chapter 6, Gringotts, Part 1 With the sound of a pop, a well-dressed boy and a happy house elf appear in front of Gringotts Bank. These people are obviously Tom and Mimsy. Tom is trying to control the spinning in his head and the vomit threatening to exit his stomach. He manages to get himself under control rather quickly for his first time traveling via house elf. Most usually vacate their stomachs immediately and or fall on the ground. Tom must have a bit more self-control than the rest. The muggle clothes and the pure white porcelain mask draws attention from the passing witches and wizards. Some write him off as an eccentric kid, while others look down on him as a dirty muggle. Ignoring the stares from the people around him, Tom stares at the bank for a moment to take it all in. Seeing the three-story pillared entrance with the words Gringotts Bank written on it, really brought it home that he was in the Harry Potter universe. As he's about to walk in, Tom sees the warning that is written in every fan fiction before the main character enters the bank. Enter, stranger, but take heed. Of what awaits the sin of greed. For those who take, but do not earn must pay most dearly in their turn. So if you seek beneath our floors, a treasure that was never yours. Thief, you have been warned, beware. Of finding more than treasure there. Truly a chilling poem to scare away any would-be thieves. Tom may have read the poem before, but seeing it for real sends a chill up his spine. Who knows what dastardly traps are set up to protect the vaults of Gringotts, and that isn't even mentioning the dragons that are on guard. After swearing to himself that he wouldn't rob the goblins, at least not until he knows he can get away with it, he enters the bank with Mimsy following shortly behind him. The inside of the bank was fairly empty, as they will be closing within an hour or so. Tellers lined the left and the right with a beautiful chandelier hanging in the center of the room. 
straight ahead was a single teller with an older goblin manning the desk. He must be the one in charge. Tom thought. Walking up to the teller in charge, every person and goblin eyed him as he passed. Once he arrived at the teller's desk, the goblin ignored him completely in favor of whatever he's been working on. Tom waited patiently for the goblin to finish his work as he thought this may happen. He wants to be angry or annoyed but he expected this. Feeling that if he were to interrupt the goblin he would lose, Tom just stood there and waited patiently. After ten minutes of waiting, the goblin finally addressed Tom's existence. What do you want? The goblin asks in a gruff manner. Tom didn't even speak and takes a piece of paper out of his pocket. He then hands the paper over to the goblin without opening his mouth at all. The aged goblin roughly snatches the paper and reads it. After reading the paper, the goblin thinks for a moment and motions for Tom to follow him. The goblin then leads Tom to a back door and through the hall's gringots to a secluded meeting room. Once they were alone in the room, the goblin speaks up. We're alone like you said so hand over my money. The goblin says and Tom throws him a stack of cash from his pocket. One thousand pounds is promised. Tom says as the goblin starts counting the money. All right, it's all here. You've got your private meeting. Now, take off your mask so we can conduct whatever business you came here to get done. I don't do business with people I don't know. The goblin says resolutely. Seeing no other way to go about this, Tom takes off his mask revealing his face to the goblin. Hello, I'm Tom Riddle. What may I address you as? Tom asks. The name's a luck. Now that we're acquainted, why have you come to Gringotts Bank? Aluk asks. Firstly, I would like to exchange my muggle currency for wizarding currency. Tom says as he deposits the rest of his money on the meeting room table. That can be easily done. The conversion rate is 5 pounds per galleon, 20 pence per sickle, and 1 pence per canute. He says and looks at Tom for confirmation. With a nod from Tom, Aluk waves his hand and the money that was on the table disappears. 23,780 pounds and 20 pence converts into 4,756 galleon and one sickle. Can I offer you a bottomless bag to hold the large number of coins you'll be receiving? Aluk says with a bloodthirsty smirk. How much is it? Tom asks, knowing that he's about to be ripped off. Money conversion is most likely regulated by the Wisengamot which is the magical government of Great Britain, so Tom doesn't think a luck would try to short him there. Although, the bottomless bag is an entirely different story. Three hundred galleons. A luck says as his murderous smile widens. Yes, master? She says as she stands beside her master. Go to one of the stores in Diagon and ask how much a bottomless bag is. Try the trunk shop first. Tom orders and Mimsy pops away. The smile that once filled a luck face disappeared the second Mimsy popped away. In its place, an annoyed scowl appeared. Tom just waited patiently and a moment later, Mimsy arrived with a happy smile on her face. Trunkman says 100 gallons for a normal bag and 200 for an anti-theft one. Mimsy says proudly as she completed a task given by her master. Thanks, Mimsy. Mimsy brightens her happy smile at her master's praise. I'll take my money without the bag. Tom says to Aluk. Aluk grunts in reply while waving his hand. A pile of galleons and a single sickle appear on the table. Tom takes two hundred galleons from the pile and pushes them to Mimsy. Take this to the trunk man and buy an anti-theft bottomless bag. Tom says and Mimsy pops away. Do you see what happened, Aluk? What? He answers as he grits his teeth. You just lost a sale because you tried to overcharge me. I don't like it when people fuck with me. Especially when it comes to money. So will you continue to fuck with me? Or can we interact like two civilized sentient beings? Chapter 7, Gringotts, Part 2 After Tom's little speech, Aluk just stared at him for a moment. Neither side spoke as they just stared at one another in silence. 
Then the unthinkable happened. A luck chuckled, and that chuckle turned into a small laugh. Tom was very surprised as he thought that a luck would throw him out or something. While the goblin is laughing, Mimsy returns with a bottomless bag in hand. Tom motions for her to place the coins on the table into the bag. She snaps her finger and the coins are sucked into the bottomless bag. Mimsy then hands the bag to her master and stands at his side, ready to provide anything he may need. Haha, are you sure that you don't have some goblin ancestry? Aluk asks as his laughter calms down. No idea, but before we do any more business, I want an oath to be sworn between the both of us. Tom says and Aluk looks genuinely surprised at the offer. What kind of oath? Aluk asks. The oath would pretty much say that we wouldn't try to actively rip each other off or steal from each other. Likewise, any business dealings that involve us will be fair for both parties. I would also like for you to keep my identity and our meeting secret. In return, I will appoint you as my account manager. Tom explains and Aluk looks truly surprised. If any other wizard caught a goblin trying to overcharge them, they wouldn't even be on speaking terms anymore. Yet this boy in front of him wants to make an oath with him in which both parties would be forced to be fair to one another. Aluk has never met a wizard that would do something like this. To make an oath so easily and to a goblin as well. In Aluk's perspective, the boy before him is truly an anomaly. Maybe an anomaly worth investing in? All right, you got yourself a deal, kid. Aluk replies. Good, now give me a pen and some paper to write down our oaths. Tom says and Aluk waves his hand. A stack of paper, a small pot of ink, and a quill appear before Tom. He's never written with a quill before, but he'll have to make do with what's given to him. After spending a good ten minutes writing the perfect oath, he shows it to a luck and they recite the oath together. The oath itself said in short that they can't rip one another off, nor could they instigate a separate party to do so either. Their business dealings would have to be conducted fairly and in good faith towards both parties. If either party were to hear of something that would negatively or positively affect the other, that party is to contact the other and sell said information for a fair price. A luck was also sworn to secrecy about their meetings and any information about Tom including his identity. In return for said secrecy, a luck was appointed the account manager for any of Tom's existing and future accounts created at Gringotts Bank. As Tom's account manager, a luck is entitled to 4% of all incoming wealth. Which means any income Tom makes, a luck gets a piece of. This was added to motivate a luck to work hard in managing Tom's accounts. The more wealth he acquires for Tom, the more money a luck will receive. This isn't something new for goblin account managers, but the usual percentage agreed to is 2%. Tom is being very generous with a luck. The best part about the oaths they took, is that it's enforced by magic. If either of them breaks the oath, that person would be very likely to lose their magic. It doesn't matter whether you're a wizard or a goblin, no one wants their magic taken away from them. They could have also sworn on their lives if they wanted to. Breaking the oath in this circumstance would cause their own magic to attack the body and kill whoever broke the oath. Though neither of them was willing to make that oath, as death by magical suicide scares even the toughest goblin. With the oath sworn, the only thing left to do is sign some official contracts. A luck says and waves his hand, causing a stack of papers to appear. Where will these contracts be stored? I don't need some random goblin snooping into our business. Tom says as he needs to keep his secrecy. It's not the contracts he's wary of it's the possibility of others having access to them. He knows the contracts are fair, as the oath they took will enforce fairness. No need to worry. These contracts will be kept safe in my own vault. No one has access but me, not even my mate is allowed entrance. A luck reassures Tom as he. After speed reading the contracts just to be sure, Tom signs all of the papers. After Tom was done signing, it was a lux turn to sign and initial in a bunch of places as Tom did. Once they were finished, a luck waves his hand, and the contracts double. 
I'll keep the originals in my vault and you can take the copies. Put them in your bottomless bag for now, and you can store them in your vault once we've opened one for you. Aluk says and Tom stores his papers away. Aluk waves his hand again and the originals disappear, presumably to his vault for safekeeping. Now, why have you come to Gringotts today, besides the money exchange and recruiting an account manager? I need a few things actually, but first I would like to request an inheritance test. Tom says and Aluk nods his head as if he expected this. I see, that's easily done for a price, but don't get your hopes up. Many Muggleborns come for inheritance tests hoping to have some rich noble ancestors. I've never seen any tests return with happy news. Most waste their money on the fee and leave with nothing to show for it. Aluk warns, hoping to lower Tom's expectations. Don't worry, Aluk. I'm merely curious about my ancestry. I'm an orphan, after all. Tom replies, knowing that he'll at least be related to the Gaunts. All right, the test will cost 100 galleons. Aluk says with a smirk and Tom pays without batting an eye. This test could make him the heir to the most ancient and noble house of Slytherin, not just some rundown inbred gaunt family. He would be willing to pay ten times that price to take the test. Chapter 8. Gringotts, Part 3. Once Tom paid the 100 galleons, Aluk waves his hand causing a knife and bowl to appear on the table. Hold your hand over the bowl and cut your palm with the knife. The knife is enchanted so that any cuts sustained will heal after a few moments. Aluk instructs. Will there be any leftover blood? If so what happens to it? Tom asks as he stares at the dagger warily. He doesn't know if there's some sort of blood magic out there and he certainly doesn't want his blood used in anything of the sort. Aluk sees his reaction and does his best to reassure him. All blood will be used in the inheritance test itself. You have nothing to worry about. Although I understand your wariness in giving out your blood. One of my ancestors once gave his blood to a friend of my clan. He said it was for a ritual and it wouldn't cause my ancestor any problems. Let's just say that person didn't stay a friend of our clan for much longer. He also didn't remain living for much longer either. Aluk explains, causing Tom to become warier of his blood falling into enemy hands. I'm going to need an oath that what you just told me is true. Tom says, flat out refusing to continue until the oath is made. Hee <laughs> hee, you really are like a goblin. If we find some goblin ancestry in your inheritance test, I may adopt you into my clan. Aluk chuckles and nods his head in approval. I swear on my magic that everything I've stated about the inheritance test is true. He states and wordlessly conjures a light at the top of his finger to prove that he still has his magic. Once Aluk proved to Tom that all of his blood would go towards the ritual, Tom took the blade in his right hand, held his left hand above the bowl, and cut his palm. Blood drips into the bowl and pools at the bottom. A moment later, the cut heals and Tom pushes the bowl towards Aluk. Before handing the knife over, he checks it to be sure there's no blood left clinging to it. There was none so Tom handed the knife back as well. Aluk placed the knife to the side and conjured a piece of paper and a wooden board the size of a large cutting board. Carved into the wood is a bunch of runes and a raise that Tom knew nothing about. Aluk placed the paper on the far left side of the board and pours the blood into a small well on the opposite side. Once the bowl is completely empty and doesn't have a single drop of blood remaining, Aluk places the bowl to the side next to the knife. The blood flows from the well and through the carved arrays. As the blood passed through the arrays, the runes begin to shine. As the runes shine, the blood flows from the carved arrays and is sucked into the paper on the left of the board. Suddenly, red writing appears on the paper. Once the writing appeared, the runes dimmed and stopped shining. Aluk took the paper and read it over without much thought. His eyes widened and his cold goblin heart skipped a beat. He hit the jackpot the second this kid chose him in the lobby. Tom's accounts would make him and his clan a mountain of gold. Even if he only gets 4% of the income, it would be far more gold than his clan has seen in ages. 
Alec's mouth started watering at the thought of so much gold entering his vault. Alec brought his emotions under control as swiftly as he could and handed the paper to Tom. Tom couldn't see his face as the paper was blocking it, so he just thought Alec was being thorough and reading everything on the page. Once he took the paper from Alec, he saw something that he definitely didn't expect. Mother Merope Gaunt, deceased. Paternal Grandfather Tobias Riddle, deceased, muggle. Paternal Grandmother Elizabeth Riddle, deceased, muggle. Maternal Grandfather Marvelo Gaunt, deceased. Maternal Grandmother Lalani Gaunt, deceased. Maternal Uncle Morphin Gaunt. Heir Gaunt by blood and magic, maternal side. Heir Slytherin by blood and magic, maternal side. Heir Lufay by blood and magic, paternal side. Heir Pendragon by blood and magic, paternal side. Other businesses listed have gone out of business long ago. Also, Gaunts are too poor to have any stakes in businesses. Main Vault 38,684,921 Galleons. Main Vault 87,941,743 Galleons. Main Vault 53,941,743 Galleons. Ministry of Magic Headquarters. The list of Pendragon properties is very long. As soon as Tom started reading, his eyes widened the same as a luck. This is far more than he thought would appear on this paper. There's no way that the Tom Riddle from the Harry Potter books and movies knew about this. Either he never went to get an inheritance test, or this world is slightly different from the books. The more likely answer is that this world is different. Tom may have to look into some things to see if they align with the books and movies. Hopefully. This is the only divergence from canon. Otherwise, Tom's future knowledge would go to waste. Wow, this is my lucky day, huh? Tom says as he places the paper down. Although, I don't understand a few things. What do you not understand? Aluk asks. Firstly, how am I heir Slytherin, yet grandfather and uncle aren't, or have they not come to get the inheritance test? Oh, they've been here all right. Every gaunt comes to get an inheritance test as soon as they can. Alec smiles wryly at his memories of the gaunt family members flipping out when they learned that none of them were heirs to the most noble and ancient house of Slytherin. Then why am I the heir and they aren't? Tom asks. The answer is simply magic. All of the gaunts were seen as unfit through magic to take up the mantle. Salazar set some filters in place to keep who he deemed unfit from taking his name and ruining his house. He was smart to do so, as every gaunt I've met has been an insane nut job. Your uncle Morphin Gaunt, who's the head of House Gaunt, refuses to speak English and only talks in parcel tongue. Don't even get me started on your late grandfather. Aluk explains. All right, but how the hell am I the heir to Lefay and Pendragon? especially through the muggle side of my family, and last but certainly not least, am I royalty now? Chapter 9, Gringotts, Part 4, Plus Tests The second Aluk heard the question am I royalty, he busted out in deep laughter. Seeing the goblin across from him laughing at his question, Tom's eyebrow twitched and he glares at Aluk. Once Aluk saw Tom glaring holes into him, he controlled his laughter and reined himself in. Cough, well, you're technically a member of the Pendragon royal family, but the wizarding world has long moved past the times of monarchs. Although we are a backward world in many ways, we have a type of democratic system. Although it's not a full democracy, the leader of our country is an elected official. Could you still go by the title of royalty? Yes, but you would hold no power in the government as royalty. That doesn't mean you don't hold any power at all as you are still nobility, but in the realm of a king or prince, you're quite powerless. Aluk clears his throat and explains. Ha, huh, thanks for explaining. Do you have books on our system of government that I can purchase? I need to start studying to get these things down. Tom asks, hoping that he can start learning these things quickly. No, do I look like I work at a bookstore? Aluk replies gruffly. 
Sai, can you write a list of books you know that I can purchase once our business is concluded? Tom asks in exasperation. For a price, yes. Alux says greedily. Sure, just name the price. Tom replies without worry due to the oath of fairness they both took. Three galleons. The goblin replies and a piece of paper appears in his hand. Here, you stingy goblin. Tom says jokingly as he slides three shiny gold pieces across the table. It's nice doing business with you. Alux says and hands Tom the paper. Now, on to your question as to how you are the heir to Pendragon and Le Fay from a muggle family. He ponders for a moment before continuing. Pendragon and Le Fay were half-siblings, so you are a descendant of one or both of them. Since they are related, you could be heir to both while only being descended from one. Quite lucky for you. As for them being muggles, the Riddle family is most likely a muggle family that is descended from a squib. That squib was a Pendragon, Le Fay, or both. That's the likely explanation. Alux says. That makes sense. Tom nods as he takes in Alux's explanation. Now that that's out of the way. Alux waves his hand and four boxes appear. These hold the air rings and lord rings for Slytherin, Le Fay, Pendragon, and Gaunt. Except the Gaunt's lord ring is currently in the possession of your uncle Morphin. You may only wear the air ring as the law states that you must graduate Hogwarts before taking up a lordship. The air rings are yours to wear as we speak, but let me warn you now, the second you place the gaunt ring on your finger Morphin Gaunt will know of it. He will know who you are and based on your status as a half-blood, he will not be happy. Hmm, will the Wisengamot be notified if I wear the rings? Tom asks, hoping he answer is no. Not unless you wish me to notify them. Aluk replies easily. No, I would rather stay low profile, for now, thanks. Tom denies Aluk immediately. I'll take the Slytherin, Le Fay, and Pendragon rings. Leave the gaunt one where it was for now. No need to bother old Uncle Morphin just yet. Tom says with a bloodthirsty smile. Aluk nods in approval and slides over the three boxes. The gaunt box vanishes back to wherever it came from. Tom opens the boxes and sees two rings in each box. The rings in the first box are silver and green with the symbol of a coiled snake bearing its fangs. The only difference between the two rings is the thickness of the Lord Ring. The Lord Ring looks like a ring someone would receive if they won the World Series. While the air ring is similar in shape, but it isn't nearly as large and pronounced. These must be the Slytherin rings. The next box has two rings as well. The shape of these rings is the same as the last box, but the overall theme is different. These are black and purple with a symbol of a waning moon. These must be the Le Fay rings. The last box, once again, has two rings. The same shape as the last two, but just as before the theme is different. They are gold and blue with a symbol of a sword and a stone. These rings are obviously the Pendragon rings. The Lord rings are a bit big and gaudy for my tastes. Tom thought as he gives the rings a once-over. I must give you another quick warning. Aluk says as Tom was about to reach for a ring to wear. It's said that the Lord ring of the most ancient and royal house of Pendragon would test the wearer. Although you aren't putting on the Lord ring just yet, the air ring could try to test you in a more minor way. In fact, all of these rings will probably test you. They are from such notable and powerful people, after all. Hearing this, Tom nods and decides to save the Pendragon ring for last. First, he grabs the Slytherin air ring and places it on his finger. As the ring slides onto his finger, Tom could hear someone speaking Parseltongue in his mind. Whoever they were said reply now or die. Thinking that this may be the test for the Slytherin air ring, Tom replies in parcel tongue as fast as he can. Hello Tom thinks I'm snake tongue. After he replies, the ring glows slightly and Tom could hear the voice again say you qualify. The ring then stops glowing and the voice disappears as if it was never there in the first place. Chapter 10, Gringotts, Part 5, Plus Tests 
After passing the Slytherin Air Rings test, it was time to try the next one. Tom pulls out the Le Fay Air Ring and places it on a different finger. The second the ring slides onto Tom's finger, a pulse of magic goes from the ring all the way up to his head. The magic seeps into Tom's mind and scans his memories. Memories of old Tom and his dastardly deeds play through Tom's mind. The ring hums in approval as the magic withdrawals back to the ring. Was the qualification for the ring to accept me to be evil or something? Morgana must have been pretty messed up to set that as a requirement. Although, for once the old Tom isn't causing me problems. His actions actually helped me this time. Tom thought as he stares down at the last ring. Aluk didn't know what the tests were, but he could tell that Tom was being tested. He could sense the magic activate every time Tom would place a ring on his finger. Now that it's down to the Pendragon ring, Aluk watches on in great interest. Tom takes a deep breath and steadies himself as he reaches out and plucks the Pendragon air ring from its box. He then places the ring on one of his non-occupied fingers. At first, nothing happens and Tom just waits. No magic, no voices, no nothing. The silence in the room becomes deafening as Tom just stares at the ring waiting for what felt like forever for something to happen. After a moment of waiting, Tom thinks maybe the Lord Ring is the only one with the test. Suddenly, just as those words graced his thoughts, the ring glowed and Tom is no longer in the same room. He may not even be in Gringotts anymore. Tom looks around to see the most beautiful throne room he's ever seen. The throne room is huge with tall towering pillars holding up a domed ceiling. The left and right walls were adorned with beautiful stained glass windows. The throne is situated at the back of the room across the large doors with a red carpet leading up to it. Giant chandeliers hang on the ceiling illuminating the room perfectly. The throne itself is elevated three steps high on a stone platform. It's made of gold with gem and ruby inlays here and there. Sat at the throne is Tom Riddle. He stares around the room in wonder and confusion. Tom tries to stand from the throne, but no matter how much effort he puts into it, he can't seem to get off the throne. Suddenly, the doors to the throne room swing open, and in comes a man dressed as a peasant. He walks up to the throne and kneels reverently towards Tom. Your Majesty, I come to you seeking justice for the woman I love. My neighbor, who is a jealous man, attacked her and raped her while I was away at work. I spoke to the guards but they refused to act saying there's no proof. Meanwhile, my children saw the whole thing. I brought them as witnesses, but the guards still wouldn't hear of it. Please help me get justice for the wrong my family has had to go through, and especially for my wife. The peasant says as he starts to cry in the throne room. What the fuck? Is this the test? Tom thought as he shrugged and decided to just go with the flow. Are your wife and children here with you today? The kingly Tom asks. Yes, your majesty. I brought them knowing you'd want to speak with them. He replies. The doors open again and in comes three young boys and a woman of average beauty. One of the boys seems to be only a few years old while the other two look around ten or eleven. Their mother looks like she hasn't slept in a while and has a sad faraway look in her eyes. They come forward and kneel as their father did. Before they could speak, Tom had all of them leave the room. Who knows if these people are telling the truth or not, but it will be better to cross-reference their stories if they are told separately. The first to answer Tom's questions is the mother. She was extremely emotional throughout the whole thing, but her story was a lot more detailed than her husband's. Next was one of the elder boys and his story seemed to match the mother's fairly well. After him was the other elder boy and his story was a perfect match to the boy before him. That would make sense as they were together throughout the entire experience. Lastly, the youngest boy came in and walked to the throne alone. He didn't know what to do so he bowed three times before kneeling. The boy's story also matched everyone else's. Although he was nervous, the boy did his best to include as much information as he could remember. Tom even leaned a bit hard into this kid to see if he would rat out his parents for lying, but no matter what Tom asked, 
the kid didn't waver from his story. In none of their stories could Tom find a single discrepancy. Seeing that the stories matched up, Tom called them all back into the throne room. I've heard enough from all of you. Your neighbor will be arrested and his home searched. He will then be questioned as well as any friends and family we can find. You may return to your home. Tom says and the family thanks him profusely before leaving the throne room. Then the doors opened again, and a new person with a new problem arrived. Tom solved their problem as well and the cycle continued. Over and over the doors would open with new people with problems only the king could solve. This lasted for what felt like forever as Tom would solve the problems of peasants and nobles alike. After an eternity of problem-solving, Tom's perseverance paid off as a voice could be heard in his head. You've performed adequately the voice said and Tom appeared in the meeting room with a luck once again. This marks the end of part one of the story I'm Voldemort. Thank you for listening. Please like the video and hit the subscribe button to listen more. Hit the bell icon to get notified of all the new content uploaded to the channel ASAP.